everybody, welcome to Church Online. My name is Megan Lemons. I'm the pastor of Home Communities and Rooted at our Willamette campus in West Lynn. And I'm just so grateful to be here with you in this online space as we continue our series called A Different Kind of Happy. In this series, we've been working through a part of Jesus' most famous sermon known as the Sermon on the Mount found in the Gospel of Matthew. Specifically, we've been focusing right at the start of his sermon around a set of verses known as the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes are a part of Jesus' sermon where he talks about the virtues of his kingdom and the ways of being and living with him that invite us and the world to flourish in some kind of unexpected ways. See, the Beatitudes single out cases that provide proof that in Jesus, the kingdom of God's restoration, when Jesus returns and restores all things, is in fact, in part, available to us right here and right now through the power of God working in us and working in our world. The blessings of the Beatitudes challenge us to examine the things that we value, the things that we strive for, the things that we are comfortable with, These Beatitudes invite us to seek God's kingdom and to cultivate God's kingdom in our hearts and our lives. So the Beatitudes are a list of blessings. But when you look at it, it's kind of confusing because it says things like, blessed are those who are persecuted and poor. Blessed are the meek in the morning. And by standards of our culture, none of these folks would be blessed. Because when we think of being blessed as being prosperous or not in need or not experiencing poor health or not suffering any type of loss, this list Jesus gives us just doesn't make the cut. But the reality that Jesus points us to in his sermon isn't that life is going to be perfect, but he points to this truth that God can be found and lives can be blessed in the midst of disappointing outcomes and unavoidable pain. Jesus reminds us that our blessedness is not circumstantial, but rather our blessedness is a declaration about who we are because of what Jesus has done. We are approved by God. We are invited into his kingdom way of living. We are loved. We are accepted. We are blessed because God's presence is near to us, no matter what curveball the world might throw our way. And the world throws curveballs, doesn't it? You know how on your phone it'll curate memories from photos that you've taken? If you have an iPhone, it does this fun thing where it puts together a video montage accompanied by music, and it can be a little tearjerker sometimes. But some nights, Austin and I will sit and look through old photo collections that our phone has put together for us. And every time this happens, there is inevitably a photo of us from 2019. We'll be at Disneyland or at work or a coffee shop or or with family or just doing something fun. And each time we do this, we always wind up pausing for a moment and nervously laughing to each other saying, wow, these people in this photo had no idea what was coming. They had no idea that life as they knew it would totally change. We had no idea that we would move out of state. I had no idea that I would lose my job. I had no idea that we would lose friendships, no idea that we would lose loved ones. We just had no clue what was coming and the curveballs of change that life was going to throw our way. We had no idea how many opportunities we would have to mourn and to grieve and to cry. And I bet as you look back on your life, I bet as you look back on the last year or the last six months or the last decade, There are these moments that you can point to where something happened that was just devastating. Something like a new milestone in your life without a loved one, a job loss, an unmet relational expectation, broken friendships, broken trust, the list goes on. And with each of these moments, we have a choice. See, there's a trail marked out before us, and there's these post signs, and and one trail says it leads to mourning, and one trail says that it leads to masking. The mourning path is a path of acknowledging brokenness that leads to blessing. And the masked path? Well, the masked path is a path full of walls and barriers that keep us guarded, And at first, these guards seem to keep us safe. 
But eventually we notice that the guards on this path, they're also keeping us from life. They're keeping us from a life of of flourishing and beauty and blessing. And so Matthew 5.4 is Jesus' beatitude that invites us to the broken and blessed path of mourning when it says this, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And as I said, when life comes our way, there is an invitation towards comfort. There's an invitation towards blessing. This invitation invites us to the path of mourning. But we can't mourn what we first don't confront as reality. So what are the realities that we need to confront? There are three kind of realities of brokenness and pain that we often need to confront in our world. Now, this doesn't touch everything, but many things fall within these categories. First, sometimes the reality that we need to confront is our own sin and brokenness. There are times when we are faced with the opportunity to mourn the ways in which we contribute to the brokenness of our world of our communities, of our relationships, of our families, in our work situations, in our financial situations. Our sin can creep into all kinds of places and cause brokenness that should move us to grief. But it's not always our sin that prevents us, that presents itself in our lives. Sometimes we need to confront the ways that other people's brokenness has hurt us. We must at times face the reality of the ways the brokenness of of our parents and our partners and our friends are wreaking havoc on our lives from things maybe done in the past or from things that are happening in the present. Sometimes we need to confront the reality of not our own brokenness, not the brokenness of others, but the brokenness of the world. The reality of a fallen world means that there are senseless things that happen that just don't add up, but stem from the fallen nature of the world. Things like a cancer diagnosis or the loss of a loved one from an unexplained illness. But you see, Jesus' beatitude about mourning is God's invitation to us to put down the masks and confront the parts of our life where there is brokenness and there is pain and there is hurt. It's an invitation to confrontation. His invitation to blessing is an invitation to open our eyes and look face to face with the pain that sits in front of us. It could be pain that has happened recently or a wound that was inflicted decades ago that you've just delicately packed away. It could be from our own sin. It could be from from others hurting us. It could be from senseless circumstances of loss. But regardless of what it is, Jesus' invitation to us is down a path of mourning, of feeling, of grieving, of acknowledging. Jesus invites us down a blessed path path. Blessed are those who mourn because when we take off our masks of trying to be perfect, when you take off your mask of covering your own sin, when you take off the mask of trying to have it all together, when you take off the mask of hiding what's really going on in your life, when you take off the mask of pretending that the actions of others don't wound us in very real ways, when you take off the mask of pretending like the brokenness of the world doesn't affect affect you and the harm inflicted by others doesn't affect you when you take off these pretenses when we take off these masks we begin to tear down the walls that these masks have built up around us they're walls between us and others and walls between us and god When we move those things out of the way and we accept Jesus' invitation to mourn, which is an invitation to honesty, which is an invitation to be real, when we accept that invitation, we will be blessed. Why? How? Well, it's because in that place of honesty, we'll find comfort. But how do we confront it? Well, it first starts with acknowledging reality. 
The scriptures give us a way, not the only way, but a way to mourn and grieve and acknowledge the pain of our lives and our relationships and our world. The scriptures model for us a way of mourning called lament. When we're faced with the opportunity to mourn and grieve, for some of us, our natural inclination is to mask up, to pretend it's all okay. But even when we mask, even when we pretend, there is still a grief within us that needs to be expressed. Because we're all experiencing some sort of grief, some sort of loss in all seasons of life. We will experience losses both big and small and everything in between. We'll experience small losses, like when Taco Bell randomly decides to take nacho fries from their menu because they're out of touch with the reality of what the people really want. (laughs) But, you know, we also experience these huge milestone events that have us reeling the loss, things like losing a loved one. You know, whether our grief is this milestone moment or just a small pebble in our shoe, we have to move through it. We can't simply skip over these losses or mask them by ignoring what's happening because our grief, it's got to be expressed. In order to find hope and healing and comfort, we have to address reality. We have to address sometimes the darkest parts of our stories and our lives. We have to look it in the eye. Scripture gives us a way to give expression to our grief and and address our present realities. We can practice this spiritual discipline known as lament. Now, lament is a spiritual practice that gives expression to our grief. It is a way for us to address our grief in the presence of God. So what is it? Lament is just a type of prayer. Prayers of lament are prayers where we can be real and we can be honest with God. Laments are an expression of our grief. One author, Christina Fox, says this about lament. She says, The laments in scripture do more than just voice painful emotions. The psalms of lament in particular go further than just releasing pent-up emotions. They are more than mere catharsis. Within themselves, they are reminders of truth. They're exercises in faith. They're transformative for the believer. And I'd add that when we embrace lament, we'll find a place where we can meet God and actually be comforted. Lament is an important spiritual discipline. It's important because prayers of lament are an invitation, an invitation for us to be raw and honest, and not only with ourselves and how we're feeling, but with God. They are a way for us to express the rawness and the realness of our emotions and ourselves in God's presence. This is important because it allows us to show up before God as we really are. And when we show up as we really are, that's the place where transformation can take place. Because listen, God doesn't want to transform the masked version of you. He wants to transform the real you. He wants to comfort the real you. Prayers of lament invite us to express fully the reality of our situation with God. They invite us to cry out to God in a real way and to be met with his real rescue. We see great examples of lament in the book of Psalms. In the Psalms of lament, the writer expresses the reality of the situation before God We often don't want to do this. We like to pretty things up for God. But the truth is, we need to have these moments of honesty. We can't experience transformation in our lives and in ourselves and in our relationships without the vulnerable truth of what's really going on and bringing that before God. We cannot experience the restorative comfort that only comes from Jesus if we ignore what's happening. But What does lament look like, and and how do we lament? Well, let's look to the scriptures to see one of my favorite examples of lament found in Psalms 13, verses 1 through 6. We see a realness. We see an openness. We see a questioning. We see emotions. Let's read it and take a look. It says this. 
How long, Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look at me, answer me, God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes, they'll rejoice when I fall. But, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. This is lament. Being open with God, with our emotions, with our questions, with our longings, with our confusion. Do you see the journey he takes here? Crying out to God for help, being angry with God, and then in the end, finding hope. See, this expression of grief gives way to hope. It gives way to comfort because in the end, the author recognizes who God is. If we accept Jesus' invitation to mourn, we create space within ourselves to meet God in a way that he can step into our situation in a real way and meet us right in the middle of our pain right in the middle of the loss, right in the middle of the sorrow, right in the middle of the unmet expectations and the frustration. And when Jesus meets us in the middle of it all, we can cling to him and cling to his faithfulness and we'll find comfort in his goodness. See, our prayers of pain and suffering, our prayers of doubt and questioning, they're an opening. They're an opportunity for us to draw near to God as he draws near to us and to build a relationship with him. It's an opportunity for us to invite God into our lives, into those broken and hurting places where we most desperately need the light of his presence to shine in and restore us. When we most sincerely need to know that we are not alone, it is in those places, when we come face to face with our sorrow, that God steps in to keep us and to hold us together. We are blessed when we mourn, because in the midst of mourning, God is with us to comfort us. See, in the midst of mourning, we are comforted by a God who understands, by a God who listens, by a God who actually gets involved in our pain. We serve a God who gets involved in our grief and sits with us in it. There are several places in scripture where Jesus is in distress. We, we can turn to in order to see a God who listens and understands. Just before Jesus goes to the cross, scripture tells us that Jesus is in such agony over what's about to happen to him that he's crying out to God in distress. He is grieving to the point of sweating blood. So we can look there to see a God who understands, or we could look other places like in the gospel of John where we see a story of a God who understands, a God who listens to us, a God who gets involved in our lives. We see this in the story of Jesus raising Lazarus, his friend, from the dead. It's a story found in John chapter 11 that records Jesus' most famous verse about Jesus, and it's also some of the most comforting words about Jesus. And it's John 11.35 that simply says, Jesus wept. But before we get there, before Jesus weeps over the pain and loss of his friend, as Jesus is on the road to go see him, to go see where Lazarus has been laid to rest, Jesus has an encounter with two of Lazarus's sisters. He sees Martha first, and her first words to Jesus are words that many of us can empathize with. She says to him, essentially, if you had only been here, this wouldn't have happened. If you had only been here, my brother would not have died. How many times have we been in that place? 
If you had only been here, God, if you had only intervened, if you had only stopped this from happening, where were you? Martha cries out in lament. And to her questioning, Jesus replies in John eleven twenty five, 25, and Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. We'll unpack that more in a moment. Uh, but then Jesus is confronted by Lazarus's other sister, Mary. Mary, who is so overcome with grief that the only thing she can bring herself to do is collapse at the feet of Jesus in tears, agreeing with her sister's sentiment, if you had only been here. And it was in that moment out of a response of his own grief and seeing the grief of these sisters, his response to Mary's question of where were you was Jesus himself just began to weep. He began to weep with Martha and Mary, entering into the sorrow with them, joining their tears with his own. Pastor Glenn Packiam says this, grief is like that sometimes. All we have sometimes is questions and all we have sometimes is tears. And for both our questions and our tears, Christ himself is the answer. He is the one who restores and he is the one who weeps with us. When we mourn over our own sin, that has brought brokenness into the world, when we mourn over the sins committed against us that have brought brokenness into our own lives, when we mourn over the loss of a loved one, when we open ourselves up to the questions and the tears, we will find ourselves not alone in our distress. We will find ourselves not worshiping a God who is far off, who sets the world into motion and looks on with popcorn in hand at the latest plot twist of our life. No, we serve a God who weeps with, who comes close, who when we collapse on the ground flowing in tears, collapses next to us and cries as well. We serve a God with emotion that's moved to grieve. We serve a God who doesn't ask us to cover up our pain or act like everything is okay. We serve a God who doesn't ask us to just jump straight to hope when it feels like everything is crumbling. We serve a God who instead joins us in the rubble. Psalms 34, 18 depicts this perfectly when it says this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. You know, sometimes we feel the nearness of God through his presence with us in prayer. Sometimes we experience the nearness of God through the comfort of a friend. Sometimes we experience the comfort of God through the relief and strategies found in therapy. The reality is that we serve a God who comes close, who draws near, who has feeling and emotion and is grieved over the pain and the wounds of the world and the pain and the wounds in our life. So when all you can do is cry, know that God is right there crying with you. But not only does God get involved by weeping with us, just as he did with Mary, we serve a God who gets involved because he has an ultimate plan to redeem and restore all things. We are comforted by a Jesus who cries with us, just as he cried with Mary, but we're also comforted by a Jesus who gets involved. We can be comforted by the words of comfort that Jesus gives Martha, when he says to her question of why and why were you not here, he reminds her and says, I am the resurrection and the life. To a mourning woman who is questioning Jesus and questioning God and questioning his intention and questioning his goodness and questioning his presence, I imagine that Martha runs into the arms of Jesus and he listens to her doubt and her anger and her lament. He listens as she draws near to him, maybe even beating on his chest saying, why were you not here? I imagine in that moment that he brings her close 
And he says, don't you remember? I'm the resurrection. I imagine that Jesus does this for us as well in our morning. When nothing makes sense, when there's no good answers, when there's no solution to the grief that overtakes us and to the mourning that we are experiencing, I imagine that Jesus whispers to us, if you can hold on to nothing right now, hold on to this hope, that I am the resurrection. Essentially, Jesus is saying, hold on to this. I am with you. I am at work. And one day, I'm going to restore everything. And I'm going to make all things new. Now, in the story of Lazarus, Jesus does raise Lazarus from the dead and restores him right there. What I love about this story is this story is giving us a foretaste of what is to come. Though we mourn now, we do not mourn as those who have no hope, but we have the hope of Jesus' return. We have the hope of the kingdom of God. We have the hope of a future in which God will restore all things, all people, all the earth. God gives us this beautiful picture of this day in the scriptures. In Jeremiah 31, it says this, There, life will be like a watered garden, and all their sorrows will be gone. The young women will dance for joy, and the men, old and young, will join the celebration. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and exchange their sorrow for rejoicing. There will be singing. There will be flourishing. There will be rejoicing. There will be a day when mourning is turned into dancing, when all things and all people are made new and restored. But until then, through walking in our grief with Jesus, we get a taste of this future by the reality of his presence with us in our grief and pain right now. Until then, we're invited to express our grief through lament. Until then, we are invited by Jesus to walk with him through our path of pain, taking off our masks that build up walls. And when we're ready, we can enter into our grief knowing that we're not alone, because God is with us, knowing that we're not alone because we are together and God has called each and every one of us to grieve with those who grieve and rejoice with those who rejoice. So blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who say yes to Jesus' invitation to walk this path of facing the brokenness of the world. Because on that path of honesty and lament, we will find a God who understands. We'll find a God who actually listens. We'll find a God who gets involved by weeping with us and by, in the end, restoring all things. So blessed are those who mourn because we have the opportunity to be comforted by God. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you draw near to us in our pain, that you are not repelled by the dark things that happen in our lives by us and to us or things that are just random. God, I thank you that in those dark places, in those places of pain and brokenness, that you come so close. And Lord, I pray for those who are right now in the midst of pain and suffering, Lord. Would you give them the bravery to be honest with you about their feelings? And God, I pray that you would comfort them. Lord, that your peace would surround them. Lord, that you would send folks around them who know how to sit with them, who know how to cry with them, Lord. And help us to be a people who would enter into the painful parts of people's stories just as you entered into ours, Lord. I thank you for who you are and what you do. It's your name we pray these things. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today for Church Online. We would love to see you in person at any of our Sunday services, at any of our campuses, whichever one is close to you. Check out the website for service times and all of the fun things happening. And I can't wait to see you again soon.